have to begin with a confession to the um, program organizers. I'm really sorry, Rob, Cohen, um, Mary Lou, and, um, and George, but I did something that I wouldn't normally do when I was going to give a big speech like this. Um, I set my alarm clock for five o'clock in the morning and started watching TV. <laughs> um, I think there may be some others in the room who may have done the same thing. Um, yes, who also at 6 a.m. watched a self-proclaimed skinny kid with a black Kenyan father and a white anthropologist mother win a landslide victory to become the first black president of the United States. And I listened to his acceptance speech. And as I listened to Barack Obama's inspiring speech and his message of hope and opportunity, I also really took in his explicit acknowledgement that this historic victory would never have happened were it not for the many millions of Americans, white, black, Hispanic, Native Americans, gay, not gay, disabled, able-bodied, male, female, old and young, who stood for many, many hours outside voting booths, the highest turnout in American history in recent times, because they would not accept a continuity with the past, because they had decided that they wanted a new direction for their country because they had decided that they themselves would be the agents for change. And as I listened to Obama's acceptance speech, my mind turned to where I would be later this afternoon in this hall, and my mind turned to you, the audience. And I started thinking about you, not in terms of the jobs you do. Um, I know this is a very diverse audience. Some of you are students here at RSM and elsewhere. Some of you come from business, some from NGOs, from some from civil society. But I wasn't thinking of you in those terms. I wasn't thinking of you in terms of your intelligence, your intellectual capabilities, your smarts, your engagement with these sorts of issues. But in terms of how each of you individually and collectively are able to change our world and our destiny. We are all Americans today. The trajectory that we are collectively on is not a predetermined one, not a constant one. It's a dynamic force that we ourselves can change and shape and this world needs changing and needs reshaping because the current trajectory is neither fair, nor just, nor safe, nor secure. Although the gains from globalization over the past few decades and technological advances have been great, vaccines exist that didn't before, medicines, immunizations, Developments in telecoms mean that over a billion people have access to television, internet, mobile telephony that they didn't before. Over two billion people in China, India, and elsewhere in Asia have seen their lives improve over the past few decades. The gains have not been adequately shared. In fact, the, get, the gap between the richest and the poorest is bigger than ever before in history. Vaccines exist, but millions of people do not have access to them. A billion people at the lowest end of society are experiencing not only economic stagnation, but their lives are perceptibly worse. In fact, it's such a stark contrast that if I had to sum up the world of today, I would say that it is a world of exclusion, a world of extremes, a world in which societal and environmental justice have become so decoupled from the 
global economy that last year the 400 richest Americans were able to earn the combined income of 161 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, a world in which 30,000 children die every single day from poverty-related diseases. And just to put that in some sort of perspective, it's as if one day everyone in Boxdell died, and then the next day everyone in Bussum died, and the next day everyone in Oldenzaal died, and the next day everyone in snakes that died and the world did nothing. A world in which we are destroying our environment, watching our ice caps melt, watching sea levels rise, something surely of concern here in the Netherlands, and yet sleepwalking into our future. I want to ask a question of you in this room. Who in this room feels that their lives are better than the lives of their parents? Who in this room feels that the lives of your children are likely to be better than yours? <laughs> how depressing that is. <laughs> and yet how exciting that we in this room have the opportunity to change that. Yes, we. You and me. Each of us in this room has a part to play in changing not only our individual future, but our collective one. Partnerships for development are not just a concept that academics talk about in their ivory towers, or something that business and non-governmental organization and government elites can do amongst themselves. We can all partner up to make this a better world, whatever we do, wherever we work, whatever we study, whatever background we are from. As citizens, it means recognizing that we have the moral authority and the right to make demands of our politicians and make sure that these demands are met. Demands that they do not follow xenophobic, fearful, voices of populism that seriously investigate the causes of domestic ills, often inequality, often poverty, something we're seeing here in Rotterdam with the lines at food banks rising over the past few weeks as the economic crisis starts to hurt here too. Demands that they do not replicate the short-termism that played such a role in the financial crisis <clears throat> with their political choices, but be, as others today have said, willing to make decisions that may be unpopular in the short term, but be for our long-term collective gain. Demands that they use their power and influence to better not only our lives, but also the lives of those thousands of miles away. I think you have a few cows here in the Netherlands, all right? Well, just reflect upon this. Every European Union cow continues to be subsidized for over two euros a day, while over a billion people live on less than that. It's a travesty that the world's poorest people cannot sell their products to our markets because of our protectionist policies, our trade barriers. We must demand that politicians, and there are politicians in this room, put the lives of billions of people before those of cows. And in these bittersweet times of global economic recession, but now global political hope, I think we need to add to these demands a new one, that our politicians remain steadfast in their pledges to help the world's poor and the environment, and not in our names, 
make the lives of those whose lives are already terribly hard even more unbearable. Not renege on our pledges to the environment with the excuse that today they do not have the resources to meet these commitments. Governments that were able to find hundreds of millions of dollars overnight to bail out banks are able to meet development pledges. It's not a question of available resources. It's a question of political will. The money is there. We must influence how our politicians spend it. And we must make sure that our politicians understand that our tacit partnering with them in the sense of our voting for them or not voting for them at elections will depend not only upon how they treat those most successful amongst us, but also on that, how they treat those <coughs> at home whose lives are a struggle, but also those overseas too. Now, I appreciate that some of you might find it a bit hard right now, given the current economic crisis, to get your heads round the urgency to be addressing matters overseas. You may be worried about your own job security. You may be worried about whether you will get a job in this climate. You may be worried about your own income flows, the rising cost of living, the safety of your own savings. So why at such a time am I stressing our need to still focus on those overseas? Why did Barack Obama make sure that he included in his acceptance speech a reference to people in far-flung corners of the world? Well, I can't speak for Barack Obama and explain why he included that. But why I think we need to keep our focus international is really for two reasons. First, because I'm very clear on this. It's just a matter of chance, random chance, that I was born into a middle-class family in London and not born in a poor village in Africa or a favela in Sao Paulo. So why, just because of luck, should I be accorded a whole host of rights and privileges that are denied others elsewhere because of where they were born or because of the color of their skin? And the second reason is that it's not in our self-interest to allow the current level of inequity, inequality, injustice to persist. Because in this interconnected and interrelated world, when bad things happen in one place, the consequences are felt elsewhere too. We saw this in the case of the financial crisis, where the greed of Wall Street infected the banks in Iceland, and then harmed communities here in the Netherlands who had entrusted their savings with those banks. We saw how quickly in the age of globalization, bad things in one place can create a domino effect all over the world. So take, par take a parallel with the financial crisis um, in the health realm, HIV AIDS, or think about a parallel in the environmental realm, global warming. Problems elsewhere in a global world fast become our problems too, our collective problems. Kant's, Immanuel Kant's words from over 200 years ago remain even more pertinent today. We stand unavoidably side by side. But it's also not in our self-interest to allow desperate people to remain <coughs> desperate and without hope. At the extreme, this is because they can provide a fertile breeding ground for extremists, for fanaticists. At the less extreme, they can just be rightly angry and, be, and express outrage, outrage and outpouring that does have real consequences and can be treated lightly. Especially 
in the context in which we now live. A world of global media and satellite communications. A world which is increasingly transparent and where people in the poorest places now see how others live. See the rights others are accorded, that they are denied. I'll never forget Owen Sweewa, the brother of the late Nigerian activist Ken Sarawiwa. Um, tell me the story of what it was like growing up in a Boni land in Nigeria. He said, and then we got television, and then we saw, and then we saw what other people had, and then we got angry. Never before have injustice and inequity been so conspicuous. Never before has the chasm between social justice and the global economy been so wide. Never before have the excluded been so aware of their plight, and never before has there been so much that we can do. Of course, it's not only as citizens that we can affect change. As consumers, we can actively seek out where and under what conditions the products we buy are made and withdraw our custom if they do not meet requisite human rights, environmental and environmental standards. And in such a way, we can actively show solidarity with those in communities far away who make the products in this room, the bananas, the ice cream, the tea, the coffee we can drink. And if it's too hard to find out enough about the supply chain, we can actively seek out products which clearly are labelled, like the Max Havelar free trade label, so that we know how, that they, how they are made. <coughs> A whole range of products now available to us, bananas, coffee, tea, chocolate, cocoa, ice cream, many, many more. Um, 2.3 billion euros is the size of this market now. 70 times what it was only 10 years ago. It's a hugely increasing market. People are voting with their wallets, actively choosing products which they know have real environmental, ethical, and social standards, and actively choosing those that don't. In a really tangible way, affecting change, affecting the supply chain, directly partnering up with communities from which we buy. And it's essential to really remember that this has a real impact on real people's lives because as the crisis continues to deepen the economic crisis, it is possible that the price of fair trade products will go up relative to comparable non-fair trade ones. And when we're in that shop and we're making that decision between whether to pay an extra 10 cents on a bar of fair trade chocolate versus a non-fair trade chocolate. I think we need to think very carefully about do we want to be just fair weather friends there for others in the good times? Or do we want to be there to be counted upon in the bad times too? There is, of course, another facet in our lives through which we can have an impact, and that's through our work. And here, most of you in this room have something at your disposal, or soon will have for those of you who are in the job interviewing process right now. Big organizations, big companies at your disposal. Something I don't have. I can come and give speeches, I can write articles, I can write books. But you have at your disposal, or soon will have, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of colleagues, suppliers, customers, purchasers, who you, if you put your collective skills together, your collective brain power, your collective resources, your collective compassion, can really make a difference in terms of making this a better world. Now, you may think this is beyond one's job description. But thinking about such global issues or solving domestic ills is really something that one should do in one's free time. And 
and not something that happens in the workplace. And you know what? That may have been true five or ten years ago. But today, the business case for giving employees time off to volunteer, for creating and designing new products that are sustainable or that meet the needs of the poor, for developing ethical and environmentally sound products, for front-running regulation, are all very clear. And to understand this important point, I just want to spend a couple of minutes laying out for you the social, economic, political environment today, an environment very different to the environment of 10 years ago. You see, <coughs> once upon a time, politicians were people who everyone deferred to. People's concerns were really just on their own immediate environment. And nothing more was expected of corporations but that they delivered good products at a fair price and realized profits to their shareholders. And then things started to change. Trust in politicians started to fall. Membership of political parties fell. It wasn't that people weren't interested in politics and really from last night's this morning's results, we see that they are interested in politics. It's just that they've lost faith in government's abilities to deal with the complex political global issues that they saw around them. And at the same time, as people were realizing this, they started realizing that corporations were becoming very powerful. They heard statistics like of the top 100 economies in the world a third of corporations. They heard statistics like the sales of Walmart and General Motors were greater than the GDP of Central and Eastern Europe. They saw McDonald's in 118 countries. And also, at the same time as they were processing this information, they started trusting and believing in non-governmental organizations pressure groups, campaigning groups, like Novib, like World Wildlife Fund, like Amnesty International, like Greenpeace, in ways that they hadn't before. In fact, they started trusting them more than they trusted government, the media, business, or any political party. And this combination of perceiving companies to be so powerful pressure groups to be so influential in setting the agenda, in setting the terms of the game. And this loss of faith of government meant that they started putting new demands on business, new demands that corporations deliver on human rights, on the environment, on ethics, demands that really hadn't been made before creating a whole new context within which corporations now have to operate, which the smartest companies are adapting to. We've already talked about the rise of the conscientious consumer, the people who vote with their pockets. Um, in the introduction, Rob mentioned a, pro a project I was involved with was setting up of um, product red. I have a red American Express card, and a percentage of what I buy goes to the Global Fund for AIDS. There's now red GAP products, red Motorola phones, red Hallmark cards, um, a whole slew of red products, um, a partnership, a way that people can go and buy a product, I now have an American Express card, in order to distribute money directly to a cause that I believe is just. And in this world of increasingly homogenized products, it's important for companies to try and create brands which have a sense of community, which can inspire loyalty, which seem to be more than just a product that can be easily tradable. Smart companies, of course, realize that it's not just consumers where they can see new markets appearing. Smart companies realize that this changing environment isn't a problem. 
It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to get more customers. It's an opportunity to get better employees and to retain the employees they have, which makes sense. People don't leave their values at home when they go to work, do they? I remember when I was advising BP, and I spoke to one of their executives there, one of their senior executives, and he told me what it was like going home at night when his company was in the news for alleged human rights abuses in Colombia. And he said that his son would say to him, Dad, why are you working for this company? And how bad it felt. People don't like working for bad companies. And they actually positively like working for good, as all the research now shows. When TNT started its partnership with the World Food Program, stopping its sponsorship with golf and um, motorsports, and instead transferring that money and resources to this new partnership for food and food crises, employees' ratings, internal ratings of the company, went up by 70%. Rabobank's volunteering program is really important to thousands of their employees. The smartest companies really recognize that in this world of today, but increasingly in the world of the future, it will be a world in which demands are made of companies, that they play a role in making this a better world. And partnerships for development theme of today's conference are a particularly smart way that companies can do this. A way that has the potential to bring new ideas, new methods, new brain power, and critically additional resources to the field of development, a field which desperately needs all of these. And for the businesses involved, offers them the potential for a better reputation as a result, for having better employees as a result, for increasing their license to operate in the countries they manufacture and sell to, and increasing their profits. And at the same time, making this a better world, a win, 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 win solution. It's not that the business of business is no longer business. Of course it still is. It's that as society evolves, what is demanded of business and what will ensure greater profitability evolves and changes too. Which is why we see partnerships being embraced by smart companies, whether it's Pepsi's new partnership with the World Health Federation getting together with them to tackle the contentious issue of stopping marketing to children, whether it's TNT's association with the World Food Programme, which isn't just putting money into it, but actually using their brain power to help logistics to get um, food to crises in a quicker way, whether it's Rabobank's partnerships with local banks in developing countries, or the credit that they give farmers in Tanzania to help them with their working capital needs, whether it's Tridus's banks, partnerships in microfinance, but also in helping coffee um, suppliers be able to sell their products in the developed world, whether it's Eureka Mayer's partnerships in the area of microfinance, allowing the poorest of the poor now to be able to get their camera, their goat, their heart insured, whether it's partnerships like Knox and Spencer's with the World Wildlife Fund, or partnerships like Tesco's um, a few years back in the UK, a very successful partnership with schools where it helped them get computers into schools when the government wasn't doing so itself. Partnerships don't only sound good, they really have the potential for delivering business, ethics, environmental um, change in a meaningful way. But let's be very clear here. They have the potential to do so. The outcome will not necessarily be that rosy. For there is a danger, and we should be aware of this, that some companies will use the cloak of partnership 
merely as a marketing slogan. When Exxon partnered up with some God knows forsaken organization to create National Tree Awareness Week, that isn't the sort of partnership I think we're talking about. Some companies may use partnerships as a kind of Trojan horse to enter new markets and then exploit them ruthlessly. Some companies will probably treat their partners as subservience, not listen to them, ignore them, try and impose their own solutions from above. We've seen how dangerous that is in the world of development, mirroring the path of the World Bank or the IMF. There's a danger that some companies will partner with others when it suits them and break their partnerships when it suits them, regardless of the impact it will have on the people on the ground. And there is the danger that any pressure group or non-governmental organization or campaigning group that partners with business will lose its objectivity, will lose its ability to criticize that business if it needs to. And in the process, we will risk losing the information we need to make our purchasing decisions and also for our own advocacy. All of these are serious concerns. Yet all can be addressed in the design of the partnership, in the choosing with whom to partner, in the monitoring of the partnership, whether through international fora, conventions, frameworks, or us as individuals taking on that role, by the credibility we assign a partnership, and the negative publicity we make sure that a partnership has if it fails to meet its promises. And also, in our demanding of NGOs that they have clear guidelines with whom they partner with, and are insisting that governments do not see this new model of development as a way to let themselves off the hook and not meet their pledges to development. Just because some businesses, some smart businesses, are stepping up to the plate in the right way. Partnerships for development can be a real source for positive change but they cannot be a single solution to the complexities of poverty, state failure, malnutrition, underinvestment, and so forth that make up the problems of development. They cannot be ever a single solution, a sole panacea. It would be naive to think that they could. But if managed correctly, if overseen, with caveats, I believe that they really do have the potential to be transformative in the world of development to an extent so potentially great that I think it's our imperative to encourage companies, non-governmental organizations, multilateral institutions like the United Nations, like the World Bank, like the IMF, governments to cast aside, yes, their outmoded stereotypes of the other and seriously investigate the possibilities and opportunities that could potentially come from working together in common cause. Partnerships for development must never be reduced to catchy slogans on a company's glossy CSR brochure or a web link on a UN website. To be real, to be transformative, takes commitment, concessions, a real willingness to listen and contribute, and yes, a recognition that long-term gains may come with a short-term cost. We have covered so much <laughs> in this speech already, and already with the other speaker's speeches, from discussing how we as citizens can use our power to partner or not with politicians to effect real change, as the American public did so resoundingly this morning with their historic 
decision to break with the past and vote for Barack Obama. We discussed how, as companies, we can take active roles in development. Um, talked about the business case for putting social, environmental, and human rights right within the core of a company's strategy. We talked about how we as consumers, but also as investors, can vote with our wallets and affect change, and in such a way partner directly with communities who need our help. We've talked about the huge potential that partnerships have in not only increasing a company's bottom line, but also in affecting global change. We have covered so much in such a short space of time. And I'm sure that the discussion that follows with Rob and Giles and Johan and Stella and Marilou will continue that. But what I think would be good now would be for each of us just to reflect for a minute or so on the extent to which, if we do work for companies, we are acting smartly enough whether our companies are realizing that this is a very new world they're operating in and taking advantage of it and understand the business case. I want us to think as individuals whether we are thinking creatively enough about the roles that we each can play in making this a better world. I want us to think about whether as consumers we enter a supermarket or a shopping mall and think enough about the impact of our purchasing decision. I want to think, I want us all to think about whether our own jobs, our own roles, whether we're studying, whether we're at university, whether we're in the workplace, whether any position that we have in our personal or professional life is taking these issues seriously enough about whether we're thinking enough about the role we can play in making this a better world, about the legacy that we can leave. For never before have injustice, inequity, and environmental degradation been so obvious, and never before has there been so much that we can do. I would understand if some of you were skeptical but don't confuse my ambition for us with a utopian vision. History is not an army on a forward march. Sometimes all it takes is one person to change its course. Sometimes it takes the voice of hundreds. Sometimes it may take thousands. But what these all have in common is that they begin in the imagination. They begin in hope. To hope is to gamble. It's to bet on the future we want, not the present we've inherited. But hope is not a lottery ticket that we can just sit on the sofa and clutch. <coughs> hope is an axe that we have to use to break down walls of injustice and barriers to a fairer world. Hope just means that another world might be possible, <coughs> isn't promised, isn't guaranteed. Hope is a call for action, for each of us to take responsibility for the kind of world in which we want to live. For each of us to take responsibility for forging through a new narrative in the knowledge that if we do, we can create a new global order in which the gains are not hoarded and the spoils are shared. That if we do, together, we can change the course of history.
that you make use of this little break. And I would say, let's do some partnering here, this little break. That is, if you just pass on the bananas, yeah, and because they are standing there in, in the corridors, and, and maybe can, some of them might need it without asking for it. Yes. Yes. We don't ask you to speak, so you don't have to fear that you will speak with the full mouth. Okay, let me introduce to you the, the first response to Norina Hertz's uh, keynote speech. I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Giles Bolton of Tesco is here to represent the company perspective. Uh, Giles uh, has been closely involved in Africa and development problems for more than 10 years, uh, both as an aid worker as an, and a, as a diplomat. Between 1996 and 2007, he worked for the Department of International Development in the UK, uh, where he had posts as head of the British Aid Program in Rwanda, uh, also deputy head of the International Trade Department, leading on the World Trade Organization Go Around. Uh, and basically, and I quote him now, the, the frustration and hypocrisy of overall Western efforts in Africa led him, and I have my quote then, to leave government in the spring of 2007 and publish his first book, Poor Story, an insider and covers how globalization and good intentions have failed the world's poor. Highly recommendable book also. If you like Norina Hertz's writings, uh, you will like Giles Bolton's writings, although from a completely different perspective, I would say. Uh, in 2008, however, Bolton became head of ethical trading policy at Tesco. So he made the move from one area of society to another, which is not that common. So he went from state to the private sector. Uh, so that makes him also particularly interesting and knowledgeable about today's topic, partnerships between public and private and work between profit and non-profit profit parties. Uh, and as you might know, Tesco has many partnerships with NGOs which make it an integral part of the business model. So that's why I'm very pleased that Mr. Giles Bolton is going to give us some insights in their partnership strategy. A hand of applause to Mr. Giles Bolton.